Alan, you are a cosmologist looking at the structure and origins of the entire universe. You started out as a particle physicist looking at the microscopic activity of subatomic uh, uh, particles. That is not only not inconsistent, you really have a marriage between the two, and it's absolutely fascinating to see how that works. Uh, yeah, um, I got into the cosmology business, actually, in fact, because I was dragged into it by, by a friend of mine. I probably would not have got into it on my own at all. Uh, but at the time I began working on cosmology around 1980, a small drove of particle physicists uh, began to work on cosmology. Uh, and I think we were driven largely by the development at that time of a new class of particle theories called grand unified theories. Uh, what makes these grand unified theories peculiarly interesting for cosmology, or cosmology interesting for grand unified theories, it works both ways, uh, was that grand unified theories make their most prominent predictions for processes that happen at energy scales, which are just out of sight from the point of view of conventional accelerators, uh, energy scales on the order of 10 to the 16th uh, GeV, billion electron volts. Uh, to put that number into perspective, uh, I should maybe say that by the standards of one's local power company, it's nothing at all. Okay. It's about what it takes to light a 100 watt bulb for a few hours. Uh, but what I'm talking about is uh, processes that involve having that much energy on a single elementary <laughs> particle, uh, and even your power company would be surprised at that. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a lot of energy. Uh, one way of understanding how much energy it is from the point of view of particle physics is to imagine trying to build a particle accelerator that would reach those energies. And surprisingly, we can do it with present technology, kind of, sort of, I like to say. Uh, and by that, I mean we have to stretch our imaginations a bit. Uh, if you build a linear accelerator, which is one of the standard designs of particle accelerators, uh, the output energy is really just proportional to the length of the accelerator, uh, and there's not really any limit to how long you can make the accelerator. Uh, so you can imagine taking uh, an existing particle accelerator and scaling it up until you reach this colossal energy of 10 to the 16th GeV. Uh, it turns out that if you take the largest uh, linear accelerator in the world today and scale it up and ask how big does it have to be to reach 10 to the 16th GeV, uh, it's a simple back of the envelope calculation, which everybody can do, I suppose. Uh, the answer turns out to be about 70 light years. Um, so, so I was surprised at the time that neither NASA nor the Department of Energy was actually interested in entertaining this proposal, which seemed to me to be a very important thing to try to do. Uh, but given that they were not interested, uh, we particle theorists, if we wanted to explore the most interesting aspects of these grand unified theories, uh, were really forced uh, to turn to the only laboratory that we had any access to which had ever reached those energies. Uh, and that turned out to be the universe itself uh, in its very infancy. Uh, according to calculations, which have not really changed, uh, the universe would have had a temperature where the average thermal energy uh, of the particles uh, would be equal to this magic number of 10 to the 16th GeV uh, at a time of about 10 to the minus 37 seconds uh, after the instant of the Big Bang. Uh, and that's, I think, what drove uh, me and uh, many other particle physicists uh, into thinking about the early universe as a natural extension of exploring the ideas that had become important in particle physics. Simply, you had no uh, accelerator that big, so you had to find one. Exactly. And the only one you could find was the early universe. Exactly. It's the only choice we had. Okay. Now, from the other point of view, uh, from the cosmology point of view, they had lots of observations, but really had no way of explaining in a coherent way all of those observations. So they were looking down as you were looking up. That is correct. Uh, so uh, there, there was a marriage, which I think has been a successful marriage ever since. Uh, now particle physicists and cosmologists are almost one and the same. Uh, it's really gotten to be uh, very extreme. Now almost every particle physicist writes some papers about cosmology. Um, so the well, distinction between a particle physicist and a cosmologist is almost non-existent. Yeah, you can't be one without being the other because then you're not at the state of the art of either one. Uh, that's right. That's right. Okay, so w what then can we begin to, to learn about the cosmos from the standpoint of particle physics? What, what can you say, what have you learned that can really help us with, with origins, <laughs> understanding it from the, the, the physics of the extremely small? 
Right. Um, but one of the key ideas that came out of this is inflation. Um, inflation is the proposal uh, that the early stages of our universe were uh, dominated by a period of exponential expansion uh, driven by a peculiar kind of material whose existence uh, comes out of particle physics. Uh, if one takes any standard particle theory and extrapolates it to very high energies, uh, one finds that there exists, or predicted to exist, uh, peculiar kinds of materials that literally uh, turn gravity on its head and cause gravity to become repulsive. And these energies uh, are at that level where you have this grand unified theory with, with the various forces, we talk about four forces or some electromagnetism, weak force, strong, all these forces unify. Correct. And so this is that magic area, so to speak, That's right. of extremely high energy. That's right. That's right. Uh, one doesn't necessarily have to go to such high energies uh, to find inflation. Inflation could happen at energies of as much as uh, six or ten orders of magnitude below that, actually. Uh, but we don't know for sure. But at that uh, level, at that you level certainly we expect got to have it. it. Right. Yes. And so you make right. this strange stuff. That's right. You make this strange stuff. Exactly. Uh, and the stuff um, doesn't stay forever, at least not in a typical location, um, because it's fundamentally unstable, so it does decay. Uh, now, while it's decaying here, it may still be expanding elsewhere, but that's a different story. Let's focus on where it decays. Right. Uh, when it decays, it produces a region which becomes universe. Uh, I sometimes call it a pocket universe because it's not necessarily everything that exists. Uh, and we would be living in one of these pocket yeah. universes. Now at that decay moment, that's when you have this sort of explosion that people think about a Big Bang. That's when you had, have this development or, or, or emergence of, of all the hot energy and particles and, and, and antiparticles, kind of this cauldron that we classically call the Big Bang. That is correct. And then it uh, proceeds. That's right. Inflation, when this repulsive gravity material decays, it sets up precisely the initial conditions that had been previously assumed in the context of the hot Big Bang theory. Okay. And then the hot Big Bang proceeds. Now in our situation, when, when inflation ends and when the Big Bang, as we commonly call it, the hot Big Bang begins, can we ask how big we were at that time? Uh, yeah, we can't say how big everything was at that time. We okay. have no idea how far it goes beyond okay. what we see. But we can calculate how big was the region that evolved mm -hmm. to become what we now observe today. Right. Uh, and it was uh, very small. It was about on the order of a centimeter across if inflation did take place at these grand unified theory scales. Okay. Uh, so about the size of, say, a marble. Right. And uh, I, th I think uh, uh, earlier in your career, you thought it was a grapefruit. That's right. That's right. The grapefruit <laughs> got smaller, turned into a marble. Uh, that had to do with the change in the estimate of this grand unified theory uh, scale. But it's all because of the particle physics. That's because... strictly from particle physics. That's right. So you're able to estimate. But, but even at that time, when, when we started our post-inflation life as the hot Big Bang, and we were a marble, mm -hmm. What was the rest of our pocket universe in relationship to our marble? Um, well, uh, I, I think we would define pocket universe to be the region that's essentially the same as our marble. So it would just be more space like our space, but beyond what we see okay, how, within how the pocket universe. Okay, but how much was that? Oh, how, how big was it? Yes. Uh, well, we really have no idea, but we can you know, sort of make a guess. Uh, and maybe even calling this a guess is the wrong term. We can sort of speculate on what kinds of numbers are conceivable. This may be the right way to phrase it. It's very vague. Uh, all we know is how much inflation is needed to produce the universe that we see. Mm -hmm. And inflation is an exponential process, so it occurs in a sequence of doublings, and it takes about 100 doublings uh, to make the universe that we see. Uh, there's nothing that we know of in the laws of physics which causes things to suddenly stop after 100 doublings. Uh, so it stops after some number, which we know is at least 100. So we can only guess how big it might really be. Okay. But just to make a guess that seems conceivable or plausible, uh, one might guess that it's twice as big as it needs to be. Uh, as a rough guess. Uh, if it's twice as big as what it needs to be, uh, it doesn't make it twice as big. It's much more, much more than that. It means you have twice as many doublings. Uh, so you have an extra 100 doublings. Uh, and that makes it about 10 to the 23 or 10 to the 24 times bigger than what we see in size, linear size. In volume, you then cube that. 
So, so that would give us something tangible to understand that. So if at the end of inflation, everything that we see today in our universe, which is, which is you know, 13 billion light years in radius that we see, which if, after it expanded today might be 40 billion light years in diameter, our observable universe, that was the, started out as a marble. But that marble, in terms of the rest of our pocket universe that we're in, our marble is our observable universe, the rest of our pocket universe might be the equivalent of, of our entire universe to that marble. That's correct. In some, you know, approximate That's right. way. That's right. I mean, it's that huge difference. That's right. That's right. Now, again, this is only a rough guess of what kinds of numbers are plausible. It's not, a, not really a calculation. Uh, but I think it's a, it's a plausible guess for how much bigger this pocket might be uh, than the visible universe that we see.